Let's turn in the Word of God this morning, please, to the book of 2 Samuel and the chapter number 11. The book of 2 Samuel and the chapter number 11. Just want to thank Bertie for his warm words of welcome. It's nice to be back with you again. And I do thank you for your prayers for us and for the ongoing work there in Guinea and West Africa. We were able to visit again uh, for three weeks there in March, uh, just to be an encouragement to the small group of believers that we have there to seek to reach out with the gospel to the rest of the people group there. And uh, we just thank God for his hand upon us and for just what we're seeing him do, even amongst these people in these days. And we are hoping as a family to go out at the end of June, the 30th of June through to about the 22nd of July for about three weeks uh, as a family. And so pray that the Lord will keep his hand upon us, bless us, and even bless our children as they go back out there again and uh, spend some time uh, where they grew up and where they have many memories, where some of their little friends have become believers and pray that the Lord will use them uh, even during that time as well. We hope to have a consultant check on the Gospel of John and hopefully it will be approved for printing and it will be one more Gospel that we will have available for the people in the near future. So we'll appreciate your prayers for that. So let's read, please, Second Samuel chapter 11 and commencing at the verse number one. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. It came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Moving down to verse 26. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, 
bear him his son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's just bow for a brief word of prayer. Let's seek the Lord and ask him to speak to us, even from his word right now. Lord, we thank thee once again for thy precious truth. We thank thee, Lord, for the privilege of being able to hold thy word in our hands today and to be able to come to a meeting such as this and to hear thy truth. And Father, we're asking thee to speak to us now. We ask thee, Lord, to help us to shut out the distracting thoughts, uh, all that will come against our minds. We pray, O God, that thou wouldst help our hearts to be riveted upon thee and upon thy truth. I ask, O God, for a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch these lips of clay, speak through me. And, O God, we pray that thou wouldst take thy truth and and so apply it to every heart that is gathered, saved, unsaved. Lord, may thy word be a challenge. May it be taken and used today to draw us closer to thee, to guard us against sin, and, O God, against uh, even a tragic fall. And we ask, O God, that, that thou wouldst use thy word in our lives today to sanctify us, to lead us after thyself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we think of the life of David, there's always two events that uh, come to our mind. We either think of uh, David killing Goliath, or we think of his adultery with Bathsheba, the passage that we have read here today. And these two great events uh, stand out in the life of David above everything else. And in the first one, we see David's great faith going forth to meet that giant single-handed trusting alone in God to help him. In the second one, we see his flesh, his sinful nature, getting the upper hand of him, controlling him, and causing him to fall. In David going forth to meet Goliath, we have one of his greatest victories, a victory that is universally known even to this very day. In meeting Bathsheba, a mere woman, we see David's greatest defeat, a defeat that has brought a blot upon his name that will never be erased as long as this world stands. In the first event, we see the giant that David slew. In the second one, we see the giant that slew David. And there are some very powerful lessons in this incident in the life of David here, this very tragic incident in the life of David very powerful lessons that we can apply to our hearts and lives as the people of God. And it's been my prayer that as I have prepared this message, as I seek to deliver it with God's help today, that the Spirit of God may take these lessons and apply them to our hearts, whether it's in the same area as as David fell in here, or whether it's in any other area of sin, that God may use these lessons that we find here to help us, to enable us to guard ourselves against a tragic fall such as David experienced. You know, someone has pointed out that up until this moment, David had never lost a battle. Every time he stepped onto a field of combat, David won the battle and walked off the field a victor. However, when David entered the arena of combat within his own heart, he was soundly defeated by a giant far more powerful than Goliath could ever have hoped to have been. You know, in looking at this incident in the life of David, it brings us no pleasure this morning to see a great and an eminent saint of God, a man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel himself, to see him here now wallowing in the mire of sin. We ought to come to look at this incident today with through humility within our hearts. Obeying the warning in Galatians 6 and verse 1, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. We all know our own hearts today. My, we can set ourselves up to be great spiritual people, claiming great spiritual experiences. But folks, the truth is this, there is not one of us Not one of us in this meeting this morning, including the preacher, that is beyond 
doing what David did here. That is the reality. May God help us. In considering the giant that slew David, we can see that the sinful lusts that are within our hearts are far more powerful and great than the great external problems of life. You know, we're all focused so much, aren't we, upon the great problems of life, sickness, pain, sorrow, financial problems. But as great as those problems are and as, as much trouble as those things give us in life, you know the thing that gives us the most trouble is our own sinful hearts. It's that giant of lust that's within the heart of every one of us. Christ said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. James 1, 14 to 15, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Folks, what a solemn warning we have in these scriptures to us as the people of God. Remember that we are not looking here this morning at an unregenerate man, at an unsaved man of the world. We're looking here at a man of God, an eminent saint of God, who in an unguarded moment of his life was led captive by his sinful lusts. This was the sweet psalmist of Israel who, who failed to mortify his sinful lusts and who for a moment's pleasure, a moment's pleasure, cast away uh, the joys of fellowship with God. He was led into sin, defiling his conscience, was led deeper and deeper into sin, brought upon himself uh, for the rest of his earthly days great sorrow and trouble, and has caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the name of the Lord in every generation. Someone has said that every claim that God had upon him, every obligation of his high office, all the fences which divine mercy had provided were ruthlessly trampled underfoot by the fiery lust now burning within him. Considering here this morning the giant that slew David, I want us to consider three things. Firstly, I want us to consider the cause for David's giant. The cause for David's giant. This giant that overcame David the giant of lust, how did it ever become so powerful that it was able to overcome him? When we consider the spiritual giant that David was, folks, he was a spiritual giant towering above every one of us today. But how was it possible that this fiery lust within him brought him to a point where it overcame him and caused him to fall? That's the question that we all naturally ask. Perhaps we fear that this giant or another giant will overcome us if it overcame David who, who he knew God and walked with God as he did. Surely will it not overcome us at some point? In considering this question, we need to realize that it didn't happen in a moment of time. It didn't happen in a moment of time. There were definite things in the life of David that led up to this. He was guilty of feeding his giant of lust until it became so powerful that it overcame him. Let's consider some of the things that led to David's downfall. First of all, there was disobedience. God had very expressly said in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 17, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shalt possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. He shall not multiply horses to himself, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Three very pacific things that the king of Israel was to, was to do. He was not to accumulate horses, he was not to accumulate wives, and he was not to accumulate silver and gold. 
When we look in 2 Samuel, we find that David obeyed the first and the third of those commands. In 2 Samuel 8 and verse 4, we are told that he dis disabled the horses that he had taken in battle. In other words, he, he didn't keep those horses for himself. He was obedient to this command. And then he also dedicated the, the silver and the gold that he had taken in, in battle to the Lord. Again, he didn't accumulate that silver and gold for himself. But he disobeyed the second command about accumulating wives. It would seem like David had a weakness in this area. And it seemed like he, uh, for those strong desires that he had, he sought to satisfy them by accumulating wives. But accumulating women did not solve his problem, but led to his tragic downfall. David, you see, did not nip the problem that he had in the bud. He didn't deal with it. He sought to accommodate his sinful lusts. And in so doing, he fed his giant until it became so powerful that it overcame him. My dear friend, if you want to guard yourself against a tragic downfall in this area or any other area, it's absolutely imperative, imperative that you obey the word of the Lord. You allow disobedience in any area of your Christian life. I tell you, you're opening up the door to lead, that leads to a tragic downfall. Obedience is absolutely imperative. What else led to his downfall? Not only disobedience, <clears throat> but also the neglect of duty. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Instead of being out on the battlefield leading his men into battle, David was at home, neglecting his duty. When his men were out fighting in the battle and dying, some of them, David was at home doing something else. Instead of girding on his sword for battle, he, he was at home relaxing. He was enjoying the luxuries of the palace when he should have been out there enduring the hardness and, and facing the hardships of the battlefield. What is the duty that God has called you to today? Every one of us, God has called us to a field of service, to somewhere where we can serve him in some way. What is the duty to which God has called you? Are you neglecting that duty today because of the hardness that's in it? My dear friends, the, the work of God and the service of God is not an easy thing. It is not an easy thing to serve the Lord. And it's tragic that we have so many sitting in our churches today who are neglecting their duty because of the hardness of the battle. My dear friend, we need to endure hardness the Bible tells us as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, we are in a spiritual battle. The Christian life and Christian service is not easy. It wasn't easy for David to be out on the battlefield here. And perhaps the hardness of the battlefield had caused him to be at home at this time, neglecting his duty. But it led to his downfall. Not only disobedience and neglect of duty, but also idle time. Look at verse 2. It came to pass in an evening tide. It was evening that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. <clears throat> David was in bed, taking it easy when he should have been out on the battlefield. We are told, folks, to redeem the time because the days are evil. Not lying on our bed in the afternoon, wasting the precious time that God has given to us. Oh, how precious is the gift of time that God has given to us. We sing those words, we have only one life on this earth, and like vapor, it's passing away. Folks, we have only a short little time in this world one short little opportunity to serve God, to give our all to God, to, to, to go after Him with all of our hearts. And instead of wasting that precious time that God has given to us, oh, may we be found in the thick of the battle while God has given us the strength and the ability to serve Him. Let's serve Him with all of our hearts. Let's not waste the precious time that God has given to us. 
We're told in Matthew 13 and 29 <clears throat> that it was while men slept that the enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. Proverbs 12 and 24 tells us that the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. No English proverb says an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Not only disobedience, neglect of duty, and idle time led to David's downfall here, but also success. Success. You see, David knew what it was to be completely successful over all his enemies. Every battle that he had went forth to with his enemies, he had been successful. Perhaps as it went to his head and he had be, thought he'd be, he had become invincible. Do you know, folks, hard times have a habit of humbling us, don't they? Whenever everything's going well, whenever there are no problems, whenever everything's running smoothly, pride can so easily come in. But my dear friends, when trouble comes, when difficulties, when challenges face us in life and as we seek to walk with God and serve Him, my friends, I can tell you from experience, it is those times that humble you. It is those times that rid your heart of spiritual pride whenever difficulties and problems come along. But whenever everything is going well, whenever we're having success, pride and self-dependency can so easily come in. This can lead us into sin. Not only disobedience, neglect of duty and idle time, success, but also a neglect of the spiritual man also led to David's downfall here. We can only speculate here, but it does seem that David had begun to neglect his spiritual health. Whenever he looked lustfully on Bathsheba that day, was he living in the conscious reality of what he had wrote about, wrote about in many of the Psalms? Think of what he wrote in Psalm 23 and verse 3. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Was David allowing God to lead him in the paths of righteousness that day as he looked on Bathsheba? Psalm 25 and verse 5, he wrote, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Was David waiting all that day upon the Lord? I tell you, if he had have been, he would not have failed as he did. Psalm 27 and verse 4. <clears throat> he wrote, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Friends, whenever a desire for the to behold the beauty of the Lord truly grips our hearts and our minds. I tell you, we will not be looking lustfully at another woman or anything else that the Lord forbids for that matter. David was not living in the conscious reality of what he wrote of in these Psalms. He was not desiring to behold the beauty of the Lord as he looked on that woman that afternoon. David had neglected his spiritual man. He had not been feeding his soul upon the Word of God. He had not been filling his mind and his heart with the Word of God. He had neglected his fellowship with the Lord. And failure to feed his soul spiritually led to the feeding of this giant of lust within his heart. These are some of the things that caused David's tragic downfall. Let us consider secondly the power of David's giant. David had been guilty of feeding his giant of lust until it became so powerful that it overcame him. And we can see three areas here in which it overcame him. Firstly, it had the power to control his mind. The power to control his mind. Look at verse 2. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. David gets off his bed. He has a, a stroll on the roof of his house. And those times a, a king often had a, a rooftop patio that was attached to their palace. It, it was covered with, with awnings to provide them with shade. It, it was high enough to 
uh, provide them with, uh, with some privacy. And as David gets up, as he takes a stroll uh, across this, this rooftop, he, he sees this woman bathe him. And the, the writer adds here at the end of verse 2, this phrase that she was very beautiful to look upon. She was a very attractive woman. And as soon as David saw her, the lust within his heart went to work. And see, because David had fed his giant until it was so powerful, it was now in control of his mind. When he sees this beautiful woman, all that he can think about is her getting her and satisfying his sinful lusts with her. You see, lust has so controlled his mind that he has totally forgotten who he is and how he is supposed to live. He saw this woman, he wanted her, and he took her. And folks, that is always how sin works. The nature of sin hasn't changed from the very beginning. Think of Eve. Whenever the serpent came to her there, she began to, after listening to what the, the, the devil had said to her, she began to look upon this fruit, and as she looked upon it, she dwelt her mind upon it, she wanted it, and then she took it. And folks, that is always how sin works. The nature of sin has never changed. The mind is the first battlefield with sin. A thought comes to us. Now, we can't stop thoughts coming to us, but one thing we can stop, and that is we can stop our minds from dwelling upon those things. If we allow ourselves to dwell upon that thought, that thought develops into a desire within our minds and then demands to be fulfilled. James 1, 14 to 15, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. As soon as David saw Bathsheba that day, he should have immediately turned his, ma- his head and fled in his mind from that wicked thought, just like Joseph literally fled from, from Potiphar's wife. Our minds have got to be guarded at all times. My, if the people of God were ever to hear that message and hear that truth as in these days, we need to guard our minds. We live in a filthy, evil world. We need to be praying for our young people. Our young people are facing at school and in the workplace filth and evil as never, ever before that many of us never faced as we were growing up. Dear friends, we need to pray that our young people's minds may be guarded and protected from the filth and the evil of this world. But not only our young people, all of us, no matter how far along we are in the Christian life, don't think that, you're, that you've, you're, you've reached a point in the Christian life where, where, where this doesn't apply to you. The Bible reminds us in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, bringing, every, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Folks, that is challenging. Every thought brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Philippians 4 and verse 8, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, think on these things. Our minds must be guarded by having them filled with pure and wholesome things. My dear friends, I'm not here this morning to tell you what you should or shouldn't watch on television, but I want to warn you, what you're watching on television, ask yourself this, Is what I am watching here, is what I am filling my mind with here, helping me as a child of God to guard my mind and to guard my heart by having my mind filled with pure and wholesome things? That is a check that we all need to put upon ourselves. Not only did David's giant here, his giant of lust, of power to control his mind, but it also had power to destroy his reason. Power to destroy his reason. Look at the second part of verse 3, and, or verse 3 as a whole. David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Whenever David made inquiries about this woman, he is told, that she was the wife of a very loyal soldier of his, 
and also the granddaughter of a trusted advisor, Ahithophel. That in itself, knowing that in itself, should have been enough to stop David in his tracks here. But no, he presses on. You see, he had lost his reason. Reason was no longer prevailing here. You know, friends, sometimes in life, if we were just to sit back, when faced with some situations in life, if we were just to sit back and allow reason to prevail, how many pitfalls we would avoid in life? We find here that such is the power of sin, such is the power of sin and lust within the, within the heart. They first of all control the mind and then they destroy the reason. People who are gripped and controlled by some sinful lust, you will find that they will often do things that they would not do under normal circumstances. It's a bit like someone under the influence of alcohol. They will do things that, and say things that they wouldn't normally say whenever they're in a sober condition. Why? Because alcohol has has gripped the mind and is controlling the mind and has destroyed the reason. Folks, let us avoid sinful lusts like we would avoid alcohol. What do we tell our children in regard to alcohol? Never touch it. Let me tell you in regard to sinful lusts and passions that often rage within the heart, don't touch them. Don't give them a foothold. Don't allow them even an inch in your life. They will cause you to lose your senses and to come to the point where you're so intoxicated with fulfilling those sinful desires that they'll be in complete control of your mind and your heart and your life. When the look is allowed to linger, lust is conceived, and lust, whenever it is conceived, sin will always be the result. And that's what happened to David here. Not only had it the power to control his mind and destroy his reason, but it also had the power to blind him to sin and to God. The power to blind him to sin and to God. Look at verse 4. David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. David now went headlong like a fool into the cesspool of the filth of adultery. Where was the fear of God that David had so often wrote about in the Psalms? It was gone. Where was his boasting in Psalm 101, 2 to 3? I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Where was that boasting? Folks, it was gone to the wind. Where was his hands, those clean hands in the sight of God that he so often wrote about in the Psalms? They were now defiled by sin. Where was the consideration of the example that he was setting to his grown-up sons? It wasn't even considered. Where was his binding obligation as the king of Israel to set before his people a pattern of righteousness? Folks, it was despised. David had totally forgotten his relationship with God. Folks, how blinding is sin. You see someone following a course of sin, and oh, how blinding can sin be. Lust has so blinded David here to the point that he's become a practical atheist. He's living and acting here as if there were no God as if there were no all-holy God that had commanded, thou shalt not commit adultery, as if there were no God who had blessed him and been good to him and delivered him from his enemies, blessed him in so many ways. You see, this giant of lust is standing so tall in the heart of David here that it has totally blocked his view of God. He cannot even see the face of God. This giant of lust is standing so strong and so powerful before him. Folks, if you follow the sinful desires that are within your heart and your sinful flesh, they will so blind you to the goodness and the mercy and the love of God. They will cause you to trample underfoot the precious 
blood of Christ that will cause you to despise the love of Christ who was nailed to Calvary's cross for every one of those sins of yours. They will cause you to fly in the face of all that God has done for you, all that he has made you by his grace. Oh, consider what God has done for you this morning. Consider what great things Christ has done for your soul. Oh, he has delivered you from hell, from sin, from darkness, from Satan himself. Oh, how he has blessed you. How he has abundantly met your needs. How he has been so good to you. And the love of Christ to you has given you a place in heaven itself. My dear friend, you follow a course such as David did here. You're flying in the face of all of that. You're totally despising all that God has done for you. May God help us all this morning. I'm preaching to you this morning. I'm also preaching to my own heart how vital it is that we guard ourselves, folks. How vital it is that we understand how sin works, how sin works in our lives. Know how we need to be kept by the power of God. Considering the power of David's giant here, It needs to be pointed out that both David and Bathsheba were at fault here. David, being a man of God, knew better. He knew better than to do what he did here. We all know that adultery is wrong. Jesus reminded us in Matthew 5 and 28 that to look on someone with lust is to commit adultery already in our hearts with them. We must be careful how we look at others. Every other woman, man, every other woman apart from your wife is forbidden to you. You must never, ever even entertain the thought. But Bathsheba must have known that where she was bathing here that day was in full view of of, of many people and of such a high roof as, as David's was here. If we are to be careful how we look at others, we must equally be careful how we look to others. There is no excuse for women to dress to be seen. Dressing in such a way as to draw attention to their bodies. Revealing clothing is unbecoming for a woman who professes to know the Lord. Immodest apparel is putting a stumbling block before others and was condemned by Christ. First Timothy 2 and verse 9 warns us that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. We have forgotten that today. In our churches, we have forgotten that. We are deliberately ignoring that. We are not obeying that very specific command of the Lord that in our own hearts, folks, we know is right that we ought to dress modestly, that we ought to be careful how we appear to others. Thirdly and quickly here, the problem with David's giant. The problem with David's giant. David has so fed his giant here that it just wanted more. It was leading him down a never deepening path. Firstly, it was leading him down a deceptive path. We read it together here. David tried everything that he could to get Uriah to... Uh, sleep with his wife in an attempt to cover up his sin. And when that didn't work, uh, Uriah didn't go home the first night. David then got him drunk uh, the next night. You see, David is using deception here to try and cover up his sin. He was being a coward. Instead of being a man and, and facing up to what he had done, dealing with his sin and dealing with its consequences, he was acting like a coward here. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso forsaketh them shall find mercy. When people find themselves in the control of sin, they will will try everything, they will do everything to try and cover up their sin. Sin leads down a path of deception. That's how it was for David. That's how it will be for us. Not only did it lead him down a path of deception, but it also led him down a, a deepening path David's deception didn't work, and so he reverted to a plan to have Uriah removed altogether. He devised a plan to have Uriah killed on the battlefield. He even sent his own death warrant with him in his own hand. 
You see, sin was leading David deeper and deeper and further and further away from God. And folks, that's how sin works. That's how sin works. It will lead you deeper and deeper, tightening its grip upon your life. A.W. Pink says, sin is never satisfied. Its nature is to drag us lower and lower, getting more and more daring in its opposition to God, and but for his recovering grace, it would carry us down to hell itself. Not only did it lead him down a deceptive path, a deepening path, but also a devastating path. After Uriah is killed, David takes Bathsheba as his wife. He shows no remorse, no remorse for what he had done. It seems that his heart had become hard and he had totally lost his sensitivity to the Lord. What a sad and tragic place to be in. And we all know folks that are there today, people who once walked with God, people who sat in our very midst here, Today, they're out there somewhere. Some sin that they did not check has so gripped and controlled their minds, their hearts has led them down a never deepening path. And today, they're nowhere with God. Their hearts are hard and sensitive, no sensitivity to the Lord and to his dealings in their lives. Folks, that's how sin works. It sears the conscience making sin easier and easier until it finally destroys the life. What a sad place we're leaving David in here today. But God willing, we're going to go on tonight to look at how God's recovering, restoring grace came to David. And thank God for the recovering grace of God. Thank God that with God there is mercy, there's forgiveness when sin is truly repented of. But I feel that we, what we have looked at this morning is, is very, very vital and important. Sometimes in our preaching of the gospel, we, we pass over the issue of sin and, and sin in the life and how sin works, and we're so quick to come to the, the remedy of the gospel. The old Puritans used to talk about a, a thorough law work where we see our sin, where we see how it works. And if we would truly repent of our sin, know the restoring grace of God, it's absolutely vital that we see sin for what it is, see what sin does in our lives, just as we have sought to look at here in the life of David today. May God help us. There's some sin that, some path of sin that you've started to go down today. Oh, may some of these lessons that we see here in the life of David, may they be applied by the Spirit of God to your heart and life. May God stop you even today in your tracks and bring you, as we shall see tonight, to a place of, of repentance, of turning from your sin, knowing the restoring grace of God. God dealt with David, bringing him to his senses. Thank God for that. But oh, what a warning this whole incident presents to us here. Christ warned us, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Folks, it calls for carefulness on our part. There is no magic solution to walking with God and guarding our, our Christian walk and guarding our walk with God. Folks, it needs worked at. It needs careful watching and guarding on our part. May God help us from our young people to our older folks, wherever we're at this morning, no matter how long we've been in the Christian life, may God help us. May God quicken us. May God enable us to press on with him and never to experience what David experienced here, but know what it is to walk with God in this world of sin. The world needs us to be those who walk with God pure above the world in sin. May, God, may they find us as such a people today.